Um, if you are a late registered person, um, the handouts are actually in the box, in the chat box. So you can um, download them from there. Just click on them and it'll give you the option <clears throat> to save them to your desktop. Well, fantastic. Well, let's go ahead and get started. It's 12.01. Let's be respectful of everybody's time. We hit record. So thank you again for you all being here with us today for Build Your Bone series. And by being here today and attending the series, you are taking steps toward improving and maintaining your bone health. And another step to move towards a healthier lifestyle for bone health is to interact with the group. We encourage you to engage throughout the series, jump in the chat, ask questions, um, engage with each other. Also participating in the activities. We hope we can provide a community of support to one another, share ideas, and of course, have fun. And Beth is going to kick us off before we move into the sessions um, on a little icebreaker. All right, so if everybody could take just a minute and type in the chat um, your favorite dairy, or if it were me, I'm gonna probably choose my favorite ice cream so we can see what everybody's favorite dairy is. Um, that would be a great way to start. And then the other thing that we would love to have you do is kind of while you're sitting and you're, we're going over the general, if you haven't already, download those lesson one or the handouts. And I want you to really make sure that you get a chance to look at that questionnaire. We'll do it a little bit later, but we have that opportunity. I see a lot of good yogurt, cheese. Um, I see chocolate. I don't know if that was chocolate. I'm assuming that's chocolate ice cream, not just chocolate, right? And so we had vanilla, I think, at one time. Ice cream is right there. Oh, a Cherry Garcia from Ben and Jerry. So we're getting good and specific. So I know there's a lot of good, um, there's a lot of good things out there. Low-fat yogurt, yogurt. I have to say cottage cheese is one of my favorites. I don't know why. I liked it as a kid and I just continue to love that as one of my things that I like. Um, ice cream and Italian cheese. Awesome. Awesome. There's a lot of good ideas in there. And I'm sure if we were to ask everybody, we can figure out a great way to have a dessert bar. Um, gelato, pistachio, Greek yogurt, right? A lot of good ones in there um, as we get started. Will you keep on putting it in there so everybody can see what your favorite is? And I'm going to have um, Wendy, if you want to go ahead and do the sessions. Sure thing. So over the next few weeks that we'll be spending together, we're going to look at the basics of osteoporosis. Um, what types of tests diagnose osteoporosis, medications, healthy eating and nutrition for bone health. And we're also going to discuss fall prevention and balance, the right types of physical activity that are good for bone health, as well as moving safely if you've been diagnosed with osteoporosis. And each week we're going to have a lesson and some activities. And during some of the sessions, we're even going to practice some balance exercises. And along the way, again, we hope that you're going to have fun. Um, engage with us and begin taking steps towards better health and stronger bones. So people sometimes think that they can't do anything about preventing osteoporosis or improving bone health, even if they've already been diagnosed with osteoporosis. And while there are some things that you cannot change, our bone health series is going to focus on the things that you can change. And these changes can really make a big difference in your health now and in the future. And you have the ability to make these changes to improve your health, which gives me chill bumps and it's exciting. Um, we're gonna take one step at a time, building your knowledge and skills and boost your confidence in making these changes. And our first step is knowledge, just knowing what osteoporosis is, what the effects are, what causes the condition is gonna be important to know. Also, knowing your personal risk factors is especially important since you have the power to change them. And having this knowledge will help you better discuss with your current concerns with your healthcare provider as well, and then work together to create a bone health care plan. And we've got step two, it includes screening for osteoporosis and medications. Screenings are going to let you know what your bone mineral density is, which is just the status of your bone health. Also, it's gonna be important to know about medications that can either help or hinder um, bone health. Moving up to third step is proper nutrition, which is essential for not only our overall health, but also for building and maintaining bones. Part of proper nutrition includes talking about supplements that may strengthen your bones. 
And staying strong includes physical activity that's gonna to help to strengthen our bones, prevent falls. Um, we'll talk about uh, weight bearing exercises and balance exercises. And this is the focus of the fourth step in building bones. Again, we always encourage you to reach out to your healthcare provider about bone health and what they recommend for you, the steps they recommend for you to take because we know that everybody's different and that your healthcare provider can give you a more fine-tuned detailed plan for your individual needs. Today, we are gonna cover basics of osteoporosis. So we're laying that foundation in, this, in the stairs. Um, what is the basis of osteoporosis? We're gonna answer questions like what it is, what causes it, what are your personal risks, and when should you get a bone scan? Some of you may have already had a bone scan and are concerned about the results. Others may have been told that you have osteoporosis or perhaps some of you think you had a good results from your bone scan or you don't have any family history of osteoporosis and you don't feel like you need to be concerned. So what we will be doing during today's session, we'll answer some of these questions. And then each week we're gonna be building on these questions or, and providing the answers to give you those knowledge and tools that you need to prevent or control osteoporosis. So without further ado, let's get started. Osteoporosis, you may have heard it called the silent thief or the silent disease, and that's because bone loss occurs without symptoms. Oftentimes people don't realize they have osteoporosis until they've had a fall, they bump themselves, like bump their elbow, they had a sprain and it results in a fracture. Some people's bones are even so fragile that even a sneeze can cause a fracture. A collapsed vertebrae may also be first thought of as just back pain or bad posture. However, it causes people with osteoporosis to lose height and have that stooped posture that some people call the dowager's hump, which also has other impacts on the body, such as neck and back strain. Osteoporosis can have a big effect on a person's quality of life. In addition to the disability itself, that may be caused by the fracture. People often fear that they will fall or fall again and break another bone. And this fear may keep them from either being act physically active or even being going out and being social, which can start that downward spiral in health. And this is why prevention, proper diagnosis and treatment are vital in maintaining our overall health as well as our bone health. So we're glad you're here today. And throughout the bone health series, we're gonna focus on several aspects of bone health, such as um, working well um, to improve your balance, reduce your risk of falling, and remember that small changes can make a large difference in your risk. So let's look at the cost of osteoporosis. By 2025, which is just around the corner, medical cost of bone fractures due to osteoporosis may rise to over 25 billion a year. And that's pretty high medical costs, but we know that the cost of osteoporosis is more than just medical costs. It could be other costs such as loss of income, loss of independence. Um, it can also increase stress on the individual themselves that's been diagnosed. It could be their families as well as their caregivers. All right, so, um, osteoporosis is a major threat to our health with more than half of people over 50 at risk and with an estimated of 54 million adults in the US that have osteoporosis or lone bone mass. Osteoporosis is not just a disease of women. 32% of those at risk are men. So one out of every two women and one in four men will face an osteoporosis related fracture in their lifetime. Osteoporosis causes an estimated 2 million broken bones each year and often results in immobility, pain, placement in a nursing home, isolation, and other health problems. Although the disease is most common in older adults, it can strike at any age. The incidence of osteoporosis and osteopenia, which is low bone mass, is increasing. This chart shows that the projected cases of osteoporosis and osteopenia in the hip and spine for adults 50 years and older who are not institutionalized compared with known cases in 2010. The numbers are in the millions and show the continued projected growth of the disease over 20 years. 
By 2030, it is expected that 13.6 million will have osteoporosis and 57.8 million will have low bone mass. So what is osteoporosis? Osteoporosis literally means porous bones. As we age, for a number of reasons, our bones lose part of the structure that makes them strong and they become less dense. This bone loss results in fragile bones that fracture more easily. Look at the pictures of bone. Our normal healthy bone looks like, kind of like a sponge or a lattice. This sponginess gives bone strength, flexibility, and the ability to absorb shock. In the bone with osteoporosis, there are large holes in the spongy matter, making it easier for the bone to break. Many people think that osteoporosis is something that normally happens to people as they get older, and they can't do anything to prevent it. Yes, there are some natural changes to bones as we age. However, osteoporosis is not a natural process of aging. Over the course of this program, we will look at the causes and ways to prevent or reduce the effects of osteoporosis. One of the most important things I hope you learn from our time together is you are never too old or too young to improve your bone health. As we have seen, oh, sorry. Um, this is a closer look at the bone with osteoporosis. Notice that big gap in the bone on the right and that spongy inner layer of the bones is weakened and more prone to breaking. As we've seen, osteopenia or low bone mass is a growing problem in the US. Osteopenia is the stage in between normal bone density and what is diagnosed as osteoporosis. Although people with osteopenia have a high risk of developing osteoporosis, many of them never progress to osteoporosis. Still, having osteopenia is associated with a higher fracture risk than having normal bone density. And in fact, more than half of fractures in postmenopausal women occur to those with osteopenia rather than osteoporosis. There are a number of factors that may cause osteopenia and osteoporosis. These include heredity, less than optimal bone de development during youth due to poor nutrition, specifically in the areas of calcium and vitamin D, abnormally accelerated bone loss, and the presence of certain medical conditions or use of medications that affect bone density. For example, having type one diabetes increases risk of osteoporosis. And we will be talking about all of these risk factors. So many of us take our bones for granted, but just think about where you'd be without them. Our skeleton supports our entire body. It allows us to get around and provides the structure that holds us together. The human body has 206 bones from tiny ones in our hands and feet to the large structural bones in our arms and legs. They help to protect our vital organs and are a storehouse for essential minerals, primarily calcium and phosphorus. Your bones are living and growing tissue. They are mostly made of collagen and the mineral calcium. Collagen is a protein that makes up the soft framework of the bones and calcium adds strength and hardens that framework. The combination of the two makes your bones both flexible and strong. About 99% of your body's calcium is in your bones. The other 1% is in your blood. There are two types of bone in your body, the cortical bone, which is the hard out layer, out, outer layer of bone that is dense and heavy. The trabecular bone is the spongy inner layer, the center of the bone that contains the bone marrow where the blood cells are produced. Different bones have different percentage of cortical and trabecular bone. Long bones in our arms and legs contain more of the hard cortical bone. Other bones, such as our wrist, our vertebrae and pelvis are mostly made up of trabecular bone with a thin covering of cortical bone. The trabecular bone is most susceptible to osteoporosis, is more susceptible to osteoporosis than the harder cortical bone, which is why the wrist, the spine and the hip are the places more likely to have a fracture due to osteoporosis. Our bones are constantly growing and renewing themselves. Throughout our lives, our bones go through a process called modeling and remodeling. When we are younger, bones grow in bone length and density. Even after bones stop growing in length, the density continues to grow. This is modeling. In the remodeling process, old bone breaks down and is replaced by newly grown bone at the same site. The process changes as we age. Over time, the bone breaks down faster than it can be replaced. This leads to loss of bone density and strength over time. Here's a closer look at that highly complex process. I have to tell you, even when I learned this earlier 
um, when I was in school, it was osteoblast and osteoclast. Well, in my brain, it's opposite. Osteoblast makes me think of an explosion, like the, like the bone is breaking down, but that's not how it is. That is the bone building. The osteoclast is that disassemble of that bone. So bone mass peaks for most people at about age 30. A lot of things peaked after age 30, I gotta tell you. After 30, bone slowly begins to exceed bone formation. Peak bone mass is influenced by genetic makeup, gender, hormones, and lifestyle. An example of the effect of hormones is the rapid loss of bone when women go through menopause and estrogen levels drop. That is a critical time for women to pay attention to their lifestyle to prevent excessive bone loss with their change in hormone levels. Nutrition and exercise play an especially important role in building bone mass early in life and maintaining or even building bone mass later in life. It might help to think of your bone mass as being like a savings account. The more you put in while you are younger, the more you will have later in life. You are never too old and never too young to start making changes that will benefit as you get older. Calcium is a major block of bone. That is why good nutrition is important, especially, sorry, let me say that again. Calcium is a major building block of bone. That is why good nutrition is important, especially for young people. Calcium needs change during our lifetime. We need more in our youth and during pregnancy. Women after menopause and older men also need to consume more calcium to help counter the effect of age on bone density. Women can lose up to 20% of their bone mass in the five to seven years following menopause, making them more susceptible to osteoporosis. In men, sex hormone levels decline more slowly. Men experience bone decline around 50. By age 65, men and women tend to lose bone at about the same rate. This gradual bone loss continues throughout life. Right now we have a video to help you look at a quick look at calcium. Hey everyone, Zach here with the University of Florida Extension in Brevard to talk to you about bone health. Uh, so imagine this, you're a 35 year old well-nourished female uh, you're healthy, and this bowl of salt represents all the calcium in your bones, right? Suddenly, boom, you're 52 and menopause starts to hit. And when menopause happens, uh, your bone density starts to rapidly decline, especially in the first six to seven years. So what we're going to do today is a little activity to kind of visualize and illustrate what that bone loss looks like if no steps are being taken to prevent it. Okay, so I've got two bowls here. This one again represents healthy bones at the age of 35 premenopausal. You've got full stores and it's about four cups or a thousand grams. And what I'm gonna do is imagine that menopause is hit and it's been active for about six years because the bone loss is most uh, significant in those first six to seven years. You lose about two tablespoons every year. So six years is gonna be about 12 tablespoons, which I'm gonna demonstrate now by putting 12 tablespoons into this other bowl. That's three, four, halfway there, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, and 12. So six years goes by after menopause kicks in and we've already lost about 20% of our bone stores and that's where issues like fractures and osteoporosis can really start to come in. So let's say you continue to get older and more calcium loss continues to happen and you're now 85 years old. So what we'll have to do is take out 14 more tablespoons. So after those initial six to seven years, the rate of bone loss does kind of slow down but it's still significant enough to be of concern. And so this is scoop number five Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, and fourteen. Okay, so age eighty five, you've now lost forty percent of your calcium and bone density and that is where high risk for osteoporosis and bone fractures can come in. 
Okay, so we've just seen how significant bone loss can be later in life. Uh, so I want to talk briefly about if it's something that we're destined to, osteoporosis, what happens with bone density, and whether it's something that we all go through. So with osteoporosis, it's a preventable disease. So with actionable steps, we can absolutely prevent it. Everybody's going to have some bone loss. It's just a part of aging. Uh, but through modifiable risk factors that you can control, like adequate activity, proper calcium and vitamin D intake, you can absolutely prevent and avoid osteoporosis. And the good news is that these are actionable steps that you can take now uh, to get great bone health and remember that you're never too old or young to improve your bone health. So thank you guys. Pretty impactful, wasn't that? Like just to be able to see that visual representation of the loss um, and the good, I like it, the last takeaway message of how um, we still have time to make some changes and that's what our series is going to be focusing on. So if you have any feedback or comments from the demonstration, please put those into the chat. And that's right, Marie, never too late. So let's look at the effects on bone mass. And although our skeleton is influenced by genetics, it can be greatly affected by three other factors, hormones, physical activity, and nutrition. And we're gonna start on the nutrition topic next week and then physical activity a little bit later. Hormones are primarily estrogen in women and testosterone in men have a protective effect on our bones. And estrogen plays a role in the balance between bone formation and bone breakdown. And as we age, that circulating level of estrogen decreases, breaking that balance, and it increases the rate at which our bone tissues begin to break down. And something similar does happen with testosterone. Low testosterone is responsible for about half of the cases of osteoporosis in men. Lowered testosterone is also associated with aging, but certain medical conditions as well as medications can also cause those lowered levels. So to look at risk in another way, according to the National Osteoporosis Foundation, and I'm just gonna read the slide, um, a woman's risk of hip fracture equals her combined risk of breast, uterine, and ovarian cancer. Take a minute to take that in. And then that's why it's so important for you, us to be using bone building strategies to reduce our risk for osteoporosis to, and also to decrease our likelihood of fracture. Who's most likely to have osteoporosis? Well, it can occur at any age in all races. However, women do account for 80% of osteoporosis cases. Although Caucasian and Asian women are more likely to have osteoporosis, the disease is increasing in both male and females and in all ethnicities. Low bone mass, which um, Beth mentioned earlier as osteop osteopenia, it occurs before osteoporosis sets in. And bone loss is that gradual process, happens when we don't even know it. Um, again, our first indicator might be um, perhaps a decrease in height or even a fracture. And that's why it's so important to take steps now to maintain and improve your bone health. A common misconception is that men do not get osteoporosis and this couldn't be more wrong. 2 million American men currently have osteoporosis and another 12 million are at risk. And about 20% of people with osteoporosis are men. White men do appear to have the greatest risk for osteoporosis, but men from all ethnic groups develop the disease. The disease in men tends to be underdiagnosed, underreported, and inadequately researched. And it's less common in men than women for several reasons. One, their men have larger skeletons and their bone loss starts later in life when the disease progresses more slowly. Men do not experience the rapid bone loss that affects women when estrogen production drops as a result of menopause. However, as men age, testosterone levels do decrease, which is thought to be one of those reasons for bone loss in men. And research does continue to be more focused on women because of their greater likelihood of getting the disease, but more studies are taking place to learn more about men and osteoporosis. Although there is an estimated 20% of the people with osteoporosis that are men, they account for 29% of osteoporotic bone fractures. They account for 80,000 hip fractures every year. 
men are more likely than women to die as a result of a fracture. And as I mentioned, osteoporosis in men is sometimes related to a decrease in that testosterone level. And two areas of concern are the condition hypogonadism and treatment for prostate cancer. What hypogonadism in men is, is when the body does not produce enough testosterone and it could be caused from autoimmune and genetic disorders, radiation exposure, and other health issues. And about one third of the men with osteoporosis do have hypogonadism. An estimated four to five million American men um, have this condition, putting them at an increased risk for osteoporosis. Another concern is the treatment for prostate cancer. The most common medical treatment for prostate cancer is androgen deprivation therapy, which is also known as hormone deprivation therapy. And hypogonadism is the intended therapeutic effect of this therapy. Men with prostate cancer who are treated with androgen deprivation have been shown to be at an increased risk for low bone mass and also hip fracture. In about one third of our estimated 2 million prostate cancer survivors in the US are currently receiving this treatment. So let's move on to youth and prevention of osteoporosis. It, it begins when we're littles. Um, bone development in youth in our younger years, or more commonly, the lack of bone building is going to impact bones as we age. Poor overall nutrition, as well as low calcium consumption, lack of physical activity, puts many of our youth at future risk for developing osteoporosis. Another risk factor is frequent dieting for weight loss, especially if the individual is following a crash diet with few calories. Um, and this can interfere with your hormones needed to build and maintain bone. So let's take a look at some of the common fracture sites Beth mentioned earlier. Low bone density can occur in any bone, of course, but however, the most common fractures are gonna be in the hip, spine, and your wrist. Although fractures happen in these three main areas, of course, we can break bones in other areas as well. Hip fractures, you can see, account for 15% of the osteoporotic bone fractures. Spine or a vertebrae is 27%, and wrists are 19% of the fractures, leaving that 39% for uh, fractures occurring elsewhere. If you look at the hip and spine fractures, they account for about 42% of the fractures, but these are the ones that are going to have the greatest impact on a person's health and ability to maintain good health and independence. Uh, wrist fractures are usually the result of trying to stop a fall, but can result in reduction in ability to function. Um, you do have like your activities of daily living, such as like preparing meals, um, household chores. And then finally, that hip fracture can severely impact a person's life. And about one in five hip fracture patients over 50 do die in the first year following the fracture and usually from associated medical problems. And often a hip fracture starts that downward spiral of health, but it doesn't have to. Um, fracture of the vertebrae are the most common osteoporotic fractures, which can also have significant effects on overall health, quality of life, as well as risk of death. Fractures in the spine may have serious complications, such as like chronic back pain, the curvature of the spine, loss of height, stooped posture, and disability. But not all fractures of the vertebrae um, cause, cause that pain. And so keep in mind, just because you have back pain does not mean you have osteoporosis. Um, there are many other causes of back pain related to muscle and nerve issues. Uh, pain from fractures due to osteoporosis are usually going to be in that mid-back to upper mid-back region, and the pain ranges anywhere from mild to severe. Fractures, when you see have the fractures in the spine, that is what's going to lead to a loss of height. And with severe osteoporosis, there may be many fractures of the vertebrae, which can cause anywhere from five to eight inches of um, height loss. And there's a suggestion from the book by Dr. Miriam Nelson, Strong Women, Strong Bones. And it's for all women of over age 35 to measure your height once a year. And if you have a loss of more than an inch and a half, this could indicate a fracture of the vertebrae. Great time to talk to your healthcare provider. So when we think of osteoporosis, we often think about what is called the dowager's hump or kyphosis, that curvature of the spine. And this is usually caused by a wedge fracture, if you've never heard of that. It's where the front part of the vertebrae is crushed 
but the back remains intact. And so you may notice that reduction in height in individuals that have had uh, or are impacted by that wedge fracture. All right. So about one in seven osteoporosis related fractures do occur at the hip, most but not all. Um, hip fractures happen because of a fall and that's why doing all you can to prevent falls is so important. And we're gonna spend a quite a bit of time on fall prevention in the next few weeks. Um, every year, over 300,000 people over the age of 65 end up in the hospital due to a hip fracture. And of those who experienced a hip fracture, about 16% died within a year. Uh, fracturing a hip may start a downward spiral in health and independence, uh, lack of independence due to surgery and immobility. And about 60% of people who break a hip never reach their previous level of independence. Once that hip is fractured, there's a high risk of another fracture. And oftentimes people, that, again, that repeated that cycle of being afraid they're going to fall, break another bone which can potentially cause isolation, may potentially becoming depressed or even being afraid to leave the home. Wendy, do you have me on teeth? I sure do. Okay. Um, I had me on the next one, so my bad. Um, research suggests, suggests a link between osteoporosis and tooth loss. As the jawbone becomes less dense due to osteoporosis, teeth may become loose and eventually may be lost. Women who have osteoporosis are three times more likely than those without the condition to lose teeth. Bone loss also may make it difficult to have dentures properly fitted. Poor chewing ability can also affect your dietary intake and a cycle can begin of choosing less than optimal foods and lesser variety. So who is at risk for osteoporosis? As we've just seen, osteoporosis affects men and women and people of all ages and ethnic groups and races. It's not just an old person's disease. Younger people, even teenagers can get osteoporosis. Osteoporosis is called a multifactorial disease because there are a number of causes. Some risk factors are uncontrollable. You can't do anything about them. But you can impact a number of risk factors like your lifestyle, which can really make a difference. So let's look at your personal risk of osteoporosis. Before we start, I wanna make it clear that no matter what your risk, you have control of your lifestyle. You are never too young or too old to improve your lifestyle choices and potentially decrease your risk for osteoporosis. So if at the beginning you pulled out that questionnaire as part of your homework papers or your um, handout papers, sorry, I have kids, my brain goes to homework very often. Um, if you look at your um, handout papers, there was a questionnaire about what your risk is for your health, bone health. So if you have already filled it out, great. I would love to see how many risks you have. You don't have to tell me what your risks are, but if you wanna just put in the chat book box how many risks you have, that would be really interesting to see where we are and see where everybody else is when it comes to risk. If you haven't had the opportunity to take that questionnaire out and do it, now is a great time to do that. I'm gonna give you just another minute to at least find it and I can see quite a few things coming in. Some are one, some are two, some are four. Um, and everybody, like we said before, some are threes, everybody has that different risk um, factor. And so it's really interesting uh, to see what we have. I see that someone already has said that they've been told they have osteopenia, but we know that we can still do things to make sure it doesn't progress. So I'm excited about that. So I'm gonna keep going while you keep going in the chat. Um, and I'm gonna start talking about our uncontrollable risk factors, right? So I don't know if any of you were surprised by your risk for osteoporosis. If you are, you can always say that in the chat because it's great to share because it might get somebody else's mind going on something too. Um, genetic factors may account for 50 to 90% of bone mass. These are the uncontrollable risk factors for osteoporosis, the things that you can't change. We won't spend a lot of time discussing these since you can't do very much about them. But the other factors account for 10 to 50% of your bone mass. And we're gonna spend more time talking about these. So there are a number of things you can do to reduce your risk for osteoporosis. 
Um, and we're gonna be talking about those over the next few weeks. For one, your diet, it has an effect on your bones. A diet low in calcium and vitamin D makes you more, pr more prone to osteoporosis. People who have eating disorders such as anorexia nervosa or who frequently diet to lose weight are also more susceptible. Your over lifestyle affects your bone health. People who don't get much exercise or those who must spend a lot of time in bed are more likely to get osteoporosis. The type of exercise you choose may also affect your bone health. Another area is cigarettes. <laughs> they aren't just bad for your heart and lungs. Smoking can also lead to bone loss. Risk of osteoporosis is yet another reason to quit smoking. Even excessive use of alcohol increases your risk as well. Excessive alcohol consumption not only leads to bone loss, but it also increases the likelihood of poor nutrition and an increased risk of falling. And as Wendy discussed, sex hormones affect both men and women testosterone for men and estrogen in women. Another area is the long-term use of some medications. They can cause the loss of bone density. These include some anticonvulsants um, and steroids. It is important to discuss your medications with your healthcare provider and pharmacist. And we will talk more about medications next time. So there's a number of diseases and conditions causes um, what is called secondary osteoporosis. It's important to discuss your risk of osteoporosis with your healthcare provider, especially if you have any of these conditions or have had them in the past. Osteoporosis is diagnosed through a number of steps. These steps include a physical examination, medical history, and blood and urine tests. Depending on the outcome, a bone mineral density test may be ordered. It's important to discuss your risk factors with your healthcare provider. He or she may want you to have a bone density test. Some of the things that you would wanna discuss with your provider include your personal risk factors, medications you take, your diet, whether you should take calcium or vitamin D supplements, and if you should be tested. And I think a couple of these I even saw when, we were, when I was looking in the chat. So I know that these are things you guys are already paying attention to, which is awesome. So here are some ideas to consider. Um, Wendy, I'm on the next one. Uh, consider to start your steps to better bones. Look at your personal risk for osteoporosis. Think about those risk factors that you can change and you gotta be willing to change them, right? Talk to your healthcare provider about your risk and remember that building stronger bones doesn't happen overnight. During the rest of this class, we're gonna focus on some steps you can take to provide you with the tools to help build your bones. You're never too old or young and you never, you would never wanna give up. So let's talk about balance. If you had to rate yourself on balance, where would that be? I can tell you for me, some days I'm more balanced than others and not just in actual balance, right? But when we start looking at balance, this is an area that we can, put, we can improve. This is something we can work on. So I'm gonna to go to the next slide because I want you to think about balance exercises that can help prevent falls and avoid the disability that may result from falling. Include lower body strength exercises that can also improve your balance. Make sure you're staying safe as you're doing this. And I'd encourage you to have a sturdy chair or a person nearby to hold on to you if you feel unsteady. You also wanna talk with your doctor if you're unsure about doing any of these particular exercises. So here's some examples. The next slide shows us standing on one foot. I don't know if you do this very often, um, but it's really like it says, standing on one foot, but you wanna do it behind a sturdy chair or holding for balance. You wanna hold that position for up to 10 seconds and you wanna try to repeat it 10 to 15 times. And then you're gonna do it with the other leg 10 to 15 times. I have to say for me, I usually do one leg and then I'll change to the next leg and then keep going back and forth. So um, you wanna make sure that you have that sturdy thing to hold in front of you, whether it be a chair, or for me, a lot of times it's my desk. I have a standing desk. Um, or even I started, since we were studying for this program and I just was looking at it, one of the things that I started doing was um, while I brush my teeth in the morning, cause I'm already standing there and I have a nice counter in front of me, I can put one hand on the counter and while I, I have an electric toothbrush, so it might make it a little bit easier, uh, but then I can brush my teeth by, with my one hand and have one foot up. So I can multitask and still work on my balance as I keep moving. It's just one way it works for me 
you need to figure out ways that it might work for you. Oh, I like the one where you're doing it while you're heating tea. I think that's awesome. Um, yeah, I hope you guys saw Jana's. Jana is our physical activity and um, exercise expert with UF5 extension, one of them. And safety first is always key. Yep. All right, we're gonna switch to the next one. Another one that can help us with balance is our heel to toe walk. And it's exactly like it sounds. And I know you've probably done this, maybe you haven't, but it's just putting one foot just directly in front of the other, hoping that your toe um, your heel will touch the toe in front as you keep walking. Um, you also wanna make sure you're choosing a spot ahead of you and focus on it to keep yourself steady as you walk. When we're talking about safety first, this might be a reason that you would have somebody else by you, or maybe you have a couch where you walk, where the backside is open so you can walk down the couch with your hand ready to grab that couch if you need it, right? Beth, I wanted um, to suggest one thing real quick on that one is that if you have a hallway at home too, that's a really good one. Cause if you notice like her head's up, like just having that hall. So if you lose balance, you've got the wall pretty close by to kind of get you back on track. Yep, great suggestion. Furniture, walls, those things that are not gonna move, right? Those are the things that we want to help us stay up. Thank you, that's a great suggestion. Um, and I see a couple different, um, I see a couple of different suggestions also in that chat. So it, you might want to check it out if you haven't been looking at it. Um, and last but not least, the last one that we're going to talk about is that balance walk. And this one's not necessarily here, heel to toe, but it is walking, choosing that spot in front of you. And again, Wendy had a great point with the, um, with the wall or the hallway, um, choosing that spot ahead of you, keeping your head up and focus and steady as you walk and you wanna walk in a straight line and you can see her arms are out to help with that balance as well. Um, but the difference in this one is as you walk, you're gonna lift your back leg, pause for a second before you make that step forward. And you're gonna repeat that for 20 steps. So you can look for ways that you can incorporate this into your um, everyday life to just help us with balance at any age, right? We can all use more balance and so, I, thought, I just thought these were great ways to get started. So on the next page, um, what are your bone building steps for the week? Because I know if I need to make sure that I'm doing something or I look at it and go, oh, I wanna do this. If I really wanna do it and I really wanna make that change, I've got to write it down. So this would be in your handouts as well, um, but look at your bone building steps this week. What are you willing to do? Um, and like I said, if you're not willing to do it, it's probably not a good goal for you, right? So what are you willing to do and help keep you on track? Another great way to do this is put it right there on your refrigerator. So every time you're getting meal prep ready, you can see what those goals are. Or maybe you do put it on your mirror in your bathroom as you go there every day. So eating, so doing any of those are great. So I loved it, Sam, eating ice cream, you mean low fat yogurt, great suggestion. And if you want that accountability, you're welcome to put it in the chat, what you think you're gonna do. So whatever it takes to help you remember what you want, what goals you wanna do is the, um, now is the time to make those decisions. And I think we're gonna move to the next slide. Yeah, before um, we do, before we oh, do, sorry. Beth, I wanted to say, so for your bone building steps, you guys. So next week when you come in, we'll, check in, we'll have you type in your chat for those of you who want to share. But we do encourage you to fill this bone building steps out each week. And this week might be, hey, I wanna go read up on a little bit more about osteoporosis, maybe more about what I can do about my risk factors, even though we will be sharing those here um, in, our set, in our series. But I do encourage you complete these, these goal sheets. And so you have a measure of your success over the next six weeks. Thank you for sharing, Janice, that's great. Wonderful, wonderful. So in summary, because we've talked a lot today, um, osteo, uh, let's review our key points. Um, we've looked at our facts and statistics. We've talked about what osteoporosis is and we've looked at your personal risk factors. This is just the first step in maintaining or improving your bone health. And as we move through, through the series, we'll look at all the individual steps to building your bones and the things you can do to reduce your risk for osteoporosis including having a diet with enough calcium and vitamin D, moving more, avoiding smoking and excessive alcohol consumption and discussing your medications with your healthcare provider are all included. And at this time, I think we wanna cover some questions. So I think I'm gonna kind of turn it to Sam who might have the questions kind of ready to go. Um, and then Wendy and I will do our best 
um, to answer those. Okay, Sam, before you begin, I wanted to remind you guys, you in your handouts, you do have the take home messages. Oh, you can't see that. The take home messages. So when we do our summary slides at the end, it's a, if you're not already jotting notes down for things that you, you know, Hopefully you heard the one of the take home message is that you're never too young or too old to start making changes, but just to write down maybe some just general notes that really hit home for you for each of the sessions. It's a good way to reflect back on each of the sessions. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and stop our recording. All right. Well, there were only a couple of questions that people